call to order this December 9th meeting of the Mopular Planning Commission. And first we have to approve the agenda. So we'll take a look. We have a print that approved the agenda. Okay, great. Motion to approve. Second. Second by Marcella. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. The agenda is approved. Next is comments from the chair. Uh, so yeah, I think we could use this time to kind of update where we work. So we, we had talked about doing some work in the meetings last time. So I, I'll start with what I did and that's today. Uh, well, before today, I met with um, a local artist uh, who puts on a lot of events and is involved with the city and teaching classes and she's kind of has her hands on a lot of things and, and about what's going on with art. Um, and kind of based on a lot of the things from our conversation, I started an outline of, uh, a, of a chapter on, for the city plan on art. Um, right now, I threw in basically three aspirations, which were public art and uh, and then pr like uh, supporting private art and uh, and then supporting art appreciation and art education. So those three aspirations to start with. Um, and then I tried to put in some goals and then some strategies for some of those things. Uh, so you can take a look. Um, but this is meant to be like the starting look skeleton for a framework. So from here, I figure we'll involve the Public Art Commission, I'm sure, in big ways. I put a couple of things in there, but and this is definitely meant to be a thing to be wordsmithed and edited and played around with, so really it's just meant to be the start of something. Uh, Montpelier Alive, I imagine, would be involved with this. So we can get feedback from those two, and then what else are we thinking? Montpelier Alive puts Art Walk together, right? Yeah, so I think so, of Montpelier Live just a lot. Yeah. And, and I think Dan Groberg also, whether it's Montpelier Live or not, I think he's involved with the art classes that the city's already doing and mm -hmm. some other things. I put in a thing about affordability, by the way, in the art education. I think that's something that um, to put in there to make sure that um, yeah. Art, we that the city's providing art, art classes that are affordable for everyone. I think it's a good opportunity to make the you know more inclusion inclusive um, city plan. So isn't in terms there, of uh, go ahead, isn't there just a children's art space? Hmm. <laughs> like I have this thing maybe that I huh. saw that was established around here, but I I can't remember. Maybe I need to go back and look. I don't know. The library does events okay, that are similar, it. but tell me where that is. Cause we're <laughs> <not just good. laughs> and VCFA, anything with them? Can we oh, that's them true. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 I mean, the high school okay. does a lot of high events, school. and um, in terms of art education, uh, this the uh, senior center does a lot with that too. So incorporating all of the various people who are doing this. Yeah, I didn't put anything about Senior Center specifically in, but uh, that is something that um, this artist talked to me about. So we can take, we can take a look at that, and yeah, once we start getting some feedback, I think we can, like I'm comfortable with us handling that chapter. Um, look, we don't need to outsource it, but we'll see how it goes. I feel more comfortable with a lot of comment from the mm -hmm. Public Art Commission. Oh, yeah. Like that's one entire aspiration at least that that, that commission could flush out. Um, okay, that's all I had. Did anyone else take a look at the materials online on either housing or um, historic preservation stuff? Have anything to say? Well, I, I looked at the historic preservation stuff, but I guess I was expecting to see like track changes and notes, so I didn't realize it had been changed, so I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but I looked at it substantively because I was like fooling around with like, am I not getting the comments to show up? Anyway, yeah, after I edited, started to edit 
it, I start realizing, like, well, we'll see. If you guys want me to, I can do a compare documents and and show the difference between what you had last time and the the current version that we have. Um, or we can just build off of this one. Um, probably not a big deal to do a compare docs if you guys wanted that. I think uh, I mean, the most important thing is just that the HPC gets the comments we had and make sure that they answer them directly. Yes. Yeah. Comments as well as the changes that we actually recommended. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, everything. How, how does everyone feel about the accessibility of the website right now? Like, if, if you took a look, like, you, I, I, I'm not very, I, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable about this, but I just wonder if, like, is, do we feel like the public can access it um, and find what they need to, to kind of follow some of what we're doing? So the public can access it off the city website. If they click the right things, they go to the city plan, right, and then within the city plan. I'm section. not sure the specific path to get there. I mean, should we just, can we just ask a couple people not on the commission to test it? I mean, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I think it would be good to see. I, I worry a little bit about um, making sure it's accessible. It might not be, it might, there may not be a lot of demand right now to access it, but I think as we can move along, right. there will be. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I am meeting with Stone Environmental with John Adams tomorrow morning um, because they're working on the ArcGIS hub, which is um, similar to what um, John had been working on with some of the web site page things. Uh, so we may get that set up. If we get that set up, that'll, you know, within a month. Stone is trying to do one for each. Um, one page for each of the city departments and so we're going to do our planning one on the city plan update so we'll see what they come up with I'm not very tech savvy on those so I'll look to them to kind of go through and make some good suggestions whether it's stone or whether it's John you know obviously John's really good at the GIS stuff as well so um, that might be an easier link um, to kind of get there so so Stone is doing one on each department? For each department, yeah, DPW, they did the snowplow one. Oh, great, okay. I um, looked at that. Yeah, so that so is online yep. if they move along. Yeah, that. I think yeah. they've got one for, for DPWs was for winter operations. So they wanted to explain to people how winter operations work so people can understand yeah. and don't get, they hopefully will get fewer questions in the office if people can go and, and understand, you know. I don't understand. Somebody just came through with a plow and just plowed down the middle of the street. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, why did they do that? They didn't even plow the street. It's like, well, there's a system to it. They send one that goes up the middle, and then they send the other trucks that come through and clean up the edges. And there's just a system that they have for doing it. Or um, nobody's plowed my street, and actually, you can look online at a real-time tracker that'll tell you where the current snow plows are and what the snow plow routes are. So it's it's a pretty informative. <laughs> page web page um, and so we'll we will get one for planning and uh, we'll do the city plan so we'll probably have more of an interactive map like John was trying to set up so people can add comments or what they like or don't like or what you know what do we want to maintain or evolve or transform and try to, to, to give people an opportunity to comment there so that's the that's the thought behind the the story map but I'll be meeting with John and uh, the folks from Stone Environmental tomorrow morning on that. Okay. Yeah. So, so we that could wait. that may replace exactly. this Google page. So yeah. So we can we can wait to do that then. Um, okay. That's great. Are your concerns mm -hmm. just about the interface? Is that really what it is? Because <laughs> I, I just, accessibility. Just, just to sort of put a fine point, like I feel like the interface is a little. It's not what I would expected to be but it's I don't think it's bad I think it's just different than what, the, like the it, first couple times yeah. I've used it I'm like this just seems a little I, I had a little trouble getting there yeah which then I start thinking about all the different people and <coughs> like all the different residents and all the you know yeah out there and, yeah but I, um, I don't know what the average amount of tech savviness is in the world these days so if yeah. you didn't approach it the way a public person would how did you approach 
I tried both ways. Oh, okay. I, you I did. tried I tried going in normally, and then I also tried just using the link. The link, of course, was pretty easy. Um, but the then, link provided to yeah. us. Yeah. But then, but then you get to the point where you've done it a few times and you don't know if it's, is it easy for me because I already know what I'm doing. Because I know where I'm looking. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm kind of asking the group, you know. Yeah, it could, it could probably be streamlined a little bit, but I, I think for, right, especially where we are right now, it's probably okay. Well, if it's, I mean, if it's changing big in a big right. way, then we can wait and check that out later. Right. That sounds great. That sounds really great. Uh, all right, that's all I have. Um, so on the... Agenda. The next thing is the uh, minute, or no, the next thing is general business, and we have we have no members of the public here to discuss uh, general business that's not on the agenda. So we'll we'll skip by that, and then we'll go on to consider the minutes. Um, then we're going to take a look at the minutes from last time. So I move approval of the minutes. Second. All right. We have first and a second. Everyone. Ready to vote? Yes. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Answer approved. Okay. Next item we have is to continue. It says to continue our discussion of the historic and cultural resources chapter. Before we, so so. So where were we? Yeah. <laughs> we were on the last page. We were on the last. We, so, so I think until we get comments. So what we can we can try to pick up where we were. And if Mike, if you could help us with that. But I'm thinking maybe we can also tonight move on to housing. Put them there. Yeah, and I didn't know at the time I put together the agenda whether other people would be working online to add comments to the right. historic changes. And if people had put in comment, maybe we would talk about them. But if people haven't had a chance. And we think we were done with the comments for now. Then we could just move on to housing, and um, the Historic Preservation Commission will see the comments and the questions um, tomorrow night. That's tomorrow night's their their meeting. Mike, can you just? Um, I, I'm fine with actually moving on to the housing piece, um, but can you just, um, for all our benefit, can you give us like a thirty thousand foot view on what changes were made? From the September version to the December version. All right. I don't have all, and, and if you don't, all my notes in front of me. The, 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 big, the big change was really we eliminated the, the cultural. We, we, we pulled right. that out, so it's not historic and cultural. It's just historic. Yeah. Um, and then I think there were just a number of relatively smaller changes. We moved a couple. Um, I asked a couple of questions. I think there was one on... What was up with the? Oh, no, I'm trying to find it. Nobody really could understand what what it was they were asking for, and it yeah. really about the themes. Oh yeah. And so, yeah, the historic themes on front. I think it was identify and develop historic, historic contexts context or story. themes, yes. and that was. The Historic Preservation really wanted that for, for their walking tours. They just weren't clear about saying it. Um, so they wanted to be able to establish themes so they could do the walking tours. So I took that out of Aspiration A and put it into Aspiration B and then kind of tied it in okay. in there. Um, so it was really just a lot of, if my memory serves correctly, it's just a bunch of line item stuff that can be captured pretty easily in a compared. Yeah, I thought so. And I okay. gave the, the direction I gave to to Meredith meeting tomorrow with historic preservation was really to start to go through and, and I think you guys had some comments about, you know, maybe we should pick one of six or, or, or how many of these would we be doing, you know, like in the strategies on the first mm -hmm. page. There are right. six or seven bullets there. You know, are we really intending on doing all seven or should we have I think John's suggestion was, you know, we should do at least one of these mm -hmm. or at least two of these. Um, so that way we've got a benchmark that we can go through and say after eight years did we do what we had set out to do. Um, so that, so I'm sorry, so that list of questions that we came up with at the last meeting have not been presented to They have not. Okay. They're, they're meeting tomorrow night. But Meredith has that list of questions. Yeah, so Meredith that, has that okay. list. That's yeah. kind of what I was did wondering. Did we actually set any benchmarks or did they set any benchmarks? 
Uh, they didn't set any benchmarks. Um, yeah. And some of them we don't need to if we're continuing policies or doing policies. Those, are, those really don't need a benchmark. But I think the reference was in cases where we had a list of things we should, you know, hear a list of eight things we could do. Well, let's go and say how many of them we intend to do. And then the other thing they were going to do is to kind of go through and pick out the things. Um, the other I think you guys had was to talk about um, what are the priorities, higher, medium, and low priorities, and what are the perhaps what are the costs or who are, who is going to do them. And so they were going to go through and, and try to look at things like compile an oral history. Is that is that a high priority or low priority? Is that not really matter? And so you know, and then to have them think about are you really going to do all of these strategies, or are there really things that these are nice things that we would eventually like to do, but yeah. you know, in the next eight, in the years, next eight years, we don't plan on doing this. Well, let's take that out for now. We can put it in a box that says these are ideas for another time. But right. um, so that's what they'll be discussing. I don't, I don't know how much they'll get through tomorrow, um, but they've do, got that list. Do we want to ask them to set some kind of benchmarks just to sort of? hold their feet to the fire if there are important things, particularly around some establishing some of their programs. Um, without I think I would leave it up to them. I mean, if they narrow it down so they only have two on the list, if they go through and say, look, uh, the mm -hmm. only thing we're going to work on is um, doing a historic inventory of the meadow and getting that in as a historic district. Great. Um, I don't okay. think we need to prioritize or have a benchmark we're only going to say we're doing one but. Okay. you know where we, where we stopped last time I don't actually have my because I don't think I would have added this note otherwise, the federal funding review. Yeah, so it looks like we got through onto the last page, and whether you've got the new one or the old one, um, it'll just make a difference what page it's, it's on. But it looks like we did, if you've got the one that's over there, at the bottom of page three, we've got the last time, so that's why you're on page. Yeah, no, I wanted to have yeah. the continuation of all the questions. <laughs> so the bottom of page three, adopt the policy that any section 106 response involving historic resources will be provided to the Historic Preservation Commission. Yeah, so that was the last that. one that we did. Yeah. And so the rest of these we didn't. Um, so continue to assist property. So all of these ones that are in that list, we don't need to prioritize. These are just things, in that case, as they, as they continue, these are things we already do. And there's um, it's an as-needed basis if we get somebody who comes in and needs a federal tax credit, Kevin will write that grant application for them. Um, but do they actually assist pro uh, historic property owners with grant writing for brownfield loans and grants? If it qualifies for this for a state program, we, we assist with brownfield loans and grants. You do, but not yeah. the commission. No, that's a staff. That's a that's staff. A staff duty. one. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm not it's not clear to me where that kind of breaks into just the staff as opposed to what the commission's saying they weren't gonna do. But this is a document that articulates what the city does. Yes. Generally. Yes. Not, and that not, was a little not bit commission specific. Actually, but many of the other things are things that the commission's going to do. Sure. But there's still yep. an arm of the city as contemplated in the document. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, we've had that with a couple of commissions to remind them that the, the plan they're writing is not necessarily their plan, their committee plan. It's the city plan, and we're asking them to participate in writing that. And so in some cases, the items that are going to get done may be things they're not, they are not doing. So um, ultimately the strategies will be assigned as to a responsible party. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. And some of it from the standpoint of, of staff are things, it, it's, it's less of an issue now than it was a few years ago when, when we were looking at staff cuts, but we wanted to be able to go through and, and be able to capture what are all the responsibilities that certain staff members do. So if that staff member's position is cut, 
or cut down in time, then we can reflect that and go and say, well, this person is also responsible for all of this. So um, it hasn't been an issue lately, but when we conceived of this, that was something we were thinking of is to make sure we reflect what staff does as well. I think that uh, look in that vein, I think it makes some sense to replace Historic Preservation Commission and throughout this chapter with just the city. Uh, yeah, I think some of this will go back to John's comment um, on, on making sure that we have the priorities and who is going to do it and what the cat cost is, even if the cost is low, medium, and high, um, that we, within, within the strategy, um, initially our thought was we would have that embedded within those links, but considering we're not going to have those links done, we, mu we should instead reflect who is doing it. Um, and a little bit of the cost, or maybe that's you know in a footnote at the end of the the piece. But we should have a little bit of what's the priority, what's the cost, and who's doing it. Um, and if it's staff, then it would just go down to staff. Yeah. Establishing the cost is going to be difficult. Yeah, in some cases that's that's going to be a tough one. We'll have to establish a something that that'll be consistently applied throughout the document what's a low value you know less than a thousand dollars what's a medium value you know a thousand to I don't know we'll come up have with to come up range. with some range that oh, we would good. apply to yeah. each one and go and say well this is a relatively cheap relatively inexpensive process or more expensive Um, can I just ask a quick question about mm -hmm. the strategy to revise the city's agreement with the Capital Complex Commission to administer design review rules? Mm -hmm. um, what is the what are the changes <coughs> that they're anticipating or that you're anticipating? So the issue we've had, and this has been an ongoing one for years. Years. Uh, so if, if you don't know, the Capitol Complex is an area bounded by basically um, Bailey and Taylor Street and Governor Davis. So within that box with the river is uh, the Capitol Complex, and it's basically like Washington, D.C. It kind of cuts out and they do their own regulations. Um, predominantly, they just look at design review. And so we've had some running disputes with them about who's doing what. So we've, we have recognized that um, their position is they are completely autonomous, no zoning, nothing applies to them. Um, you know, there's a problem in that eight privately owned parcels are in that as well. So, and they don't look at a whole bunch of things. So. They have no rules on parking. They have no rules on on setbacks. They have no rules on you know most things that you would see in a set of zoning regulations because they're only looking at design review. So we've been trying to go and argue that you know yes, you guys claim you're exempt. We don't think under law they have that broad of a thing. So we've gone through and tried on multiple occasions to negotiate a compromise I would say look we'll regulate zoning for these eight parcels but we won't do design review you guys will do design review we'll regulate everything else we'll look at stormwater we'll look at impervious cover we'll look at they want nothing to do with that they want to be completely exempt but they don't do stormwater runoff they don't do you know things that were just like you just you don't get to do this like this anymore so pretty much the only thing we have is flood hazard. Um, and actually what we have in practice been doing is we do regulate the zoning. And we do um, exempt design review because that'll go through the state. So we pretty much are operating under what we think the agreement should be. If it's a state property, we'll give you full exemptions on everything um, except flood hazard. Um, because it has to be that way. But we have pretty much said, whatever you, the state, want to do, you're welcome to do. 
um, but for those eight parcels, we're going to enforce zoning. We would like to have that in, in the agreement, but they haven't been willing to come along with it. But it's just been, it's just been a thing. It's just bureaucracy being bureaucracy. Um, so I didn't realize that they didn't have stormwater. No, they don't, they don't regulate anything. They just do design. They don't look at parking, how many parking spaces. Right, they don't or look how at much storm water. water. Is they don't look at. They don't look at. Spaces. There's no setback requirements. There's yeah. no height oh. requirements. There's no. They just don't have any regulations. They just have a design review manual, and so we're like. Oh. Who makes that decision at the state? It was a decision by the attorney general. Well, it's the capital complex commission who is staffed by BGS. And um, so they've, they are, they, they, they don't want to have to deal with the city and that's fine. Um, but they rely on a very old attorney general opinion, which is based on state law that has since been replaced and doesn't exist anymore. So they believe their exemption is X, but if you actually read, read the statute, that law no longer exists and was replaced in 2005 with one that just says they're exempt from design review, which is our position. That looks pretty clear. <laughs> so it's just been, you know, we figure, we keep waiting every time there's a change of administration, we kind of go back in and say, we'd love to do this. And um, we've had varying um, degrees of support um, to make changes, but we never could nail down a final so have you been working with the Capital Complex Commission or with BGS? Sarah McShane did a uh -huh. lot when she was the zoning administrator. So she was working a lot trying to push that through, but we just couldn't get enough common ground. So mm -hmm. um, we eventually just dropped it and figured, well, we'll we've got drafts and we're willing to reconnect with these at a later date. But um, So we'll see. So that's why we've just kept the, the, the revised agreement in there mostly because you know it's not that critical we do what we think is right anyways and they haven't either figured it out that we're doing it or what do you mean you do what you think you mean the those parcels still come in yeah so to... for example i think vnrc um recently did some work on their building or moved to it or is looking at another building so they're in the capital complex they're one of the privately owned parcels oh, okay so they came in they pulled the zoning permit from us we issued the zoning permit the state would have if, if we had asked the state they would have said no you have no authority to issue a zoning oh, permit okay. in our comp in our complex Interesting. therefore th they don't require a zoning permit at all there is no zoning they would say there is no zoning permit. There is only the capital complex approval, yeah. which is not recorded in the land records and is not. <laughs> oh. Oh. In, in which case, it becomes very difficult to defend and enforce, and, and it's just it's, yeah. they're they're not they are not set up to 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 do administration, and it and it shows when you get into the details, the nuts and bolts of you know why don't you guys make a decision and give it to us, then when somebody comes in and does a title search. To sell that property, they will see all of the decisions and everything. Can, you know, but it could it can only hurt those property owners. Yes. To <coughs> not follow the law, and then something happens. Yeah. Yeah. So we try what we think it would be the appropriate thing, which is on these eight parcels, we we work to have them get all their zoning approval, and then we tell them for design review, you need to go to the state. So this is asking for the city to have an opportunity to comment on design review for historic resources. To clarify the roles, yes. So the first, what I was talking about was the first piece, to clarify the roles and responsibilities. Yep. And the Historic Preservation Commission has requested the second <coughs> Okay. Because right now it's all with the state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they would like the ability to be able to, to provide comment. It seems like there's... A lot of other ways to approach this. One would be to ask for a new AG's opinion. Yes, we could. Um, and we worked with our attorneys in coming up with our recommendations when we came through. And really, our attorney's opinion was, you know, let's let's pick our battles and pick our places where we. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, so I'm not it's sure. not great to be in between the politics of the AG's office and the governor and BGS. <laughs> I mean, that's not a great place to be. Right? I didn't think about that. <laughs> we figured there'll be there'll be there will be a time that will come up, and then it will make sense to reintroduce it. You know, if there's a change in administration at some point, or um, just a change in um, who's running a certain department, that it might make sense to just go through and say now might be a good time to to reintroduce this conversation. It's a lot more in that strategy than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a key piece from historic protection and historic preservation standpoint because yeah. it's it is our you know most of our most historic buildings are most our iconic buildings I guess are there in the Capitol complex and um, we really don't have very much control over that area. We talked about view sheds, and much of it was view of the Capitol yeah. building. Yeah, but it's usually so. from views from outside, from outside the Capitol complex. But looking at, yeah, yeah right. It's, looking into the Capitol complex. So we complex. want to make sure we're maintaining something we want to look at. Oh. But they generally do a, a good job with their building, so we haven't had any interest in, mm -hmm. in getting involved in, in their things. But the Preservation Commission does? Uh, they wanted an opportunity to comment on projects, which I think is, I don't think is necessary to be in here because I think historic preservation technically could appear. <coughs> the, the, the Capital Complex Commission is a public body and their meetings are warned, so they could just have somebody who has access to that agenda in order to keep an eye on the agenda and provide comment when a project comes up that they want to comment on. Mm -hmm. Well, so the last couple of things here, the continue to participate with certified local government and the designated downtown program. Um, is it, Mike, do you think this is the most appropriate place to mention those things? Do you think it's fine to lay the plan out like that? Um, well, I mean, uh, in this case, I mean, these are these are just the continues. I mean, we're already a CLG. CLG only applies to historic preservation, so this would be the place to put that in. Um, the designated downtown program can apply to a number of chapters, and it will probably be in a number of chapters, but there are a lot of programs within the designated downtown program specifically targeted to historic structures. So you think it's I would, fine? I, yeah, I would, I would keep them in. And I, I like, I mean, and it's, it's your plan ultimately. I've been thinking to just continue to put it into the areas where it's appropriate. If we're talking about economic development, you know, that's another place where a designated downtown program applies and we'll have a recommendation to continue to participate in the designated downtown program in that chapter as well. Um, Okay. Well, unless anyone wants to revisit anything, um, mm -hmm. we can table this for now until we get feedback we were looking for. Okay. So with that, we can move on to the housing chapter. I didn't <laughs> put them over there because I didn't know uh, which ones we get to. <laughs> and if I hand them out, then I've got to go and reprint them for next time. So. <laughs> that has not changed. This, this has not changed. Okay, I've got this already. I okay. might have this one. You might already have that one too. All right. Oh, did that say historic? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, oh. this is historic. I've got one that oh. says. Yeah. Some of the pile must have gotten mixed. November 22nd. That yeah. says historic. This says housing. Do you have November 22nd housing? Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's the housing. Yeah. That's the, the next year. That's the current iteration. The, the, the November 22nd one's the current. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, all right, there we have it. <laughs> you can have all these. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And can I bring up the question that I emailed? Yes. You, like, um, which I don't think is a, but um, so there's a relatively newly formed homelessness task force in Montpelier. Um, so I thought, if possible, to get their contributions because they are thinking of you know how the city can address this issue. Um, and Mike just 
brought up the question, I mean, obviously, some of this may relate to housing, although I think a lot of it is going to be more community services slash shelter space, which whether you consider that housing or not is, <laughs> is a tricky question. But um, I mean, I'm happy to just send them the format of the goals, aspirations, and see, you know, see where they get on it. But I don't know. And Usually, then, I've been I, meeting oh, okay. with them, oh, meeting okay. with groups when okay. when when they get it, just so they don't feel too, um, yeah, left out left out there. Um, okay, I can see what their schedule is um, and see about. They meet at Wednesdays at noon, okay. and they are meeting every week. <laughs> oh, every week. Okay, but um, yeah, I'll maybe I'll just eat, or maybe I'll just ask one of them to email you about a good time to come because there's a lot. There's a lot going on in that. Yeah, group. I know they've and been I'm doing a lot of budget discussions, and that's. It, I've yeah. caught a couple of committees that are really kind of focused on budget stuff. Um, that yeah. So I'll ask someone to follow up with you. Okay, I just okay. wanted to follow up on that. So yeah, the 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 question that came up was really about whether it would be appropriate to have these discussions here in the housing chapter, and you know, my reply was, well, you know. Some of these things just depend on where we want to put them. Is it we're going to have a chapter for community services? Is what we're doing for the through the homelessness task force a community service, or is it housing, or is there you know? And, and that's going to be really dependent on what they're doing. I think. Um, I, I like the idea of making sure, at least in the housing chapter, that we are clear that there's a room in this city for these things, for shelters. That is something that, you know, is desirable. I think, uh, I may have mentioned this before too, I think that, I think it's, it will be important for our plan to have at least something about treatment housing for drug addiction. Um, Cause that's, there's a shortage of that in the state and there's almost none south of Burlington. So for us to say, hey, there's a place in our city for, for that. Um, it seems like those two things go together and housing's a good place for it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it may be something that comes in as a goal or something, or a strategy under D, which is really our, our it's really our, our Montpelier will have housing for all, mm -hmm. and we'll yeah. mm -hmm. affirmative, uh, affirmatively further fair housing, and that really is, is a, a large catch-all um, that really is, it's really meant to, to be just that, that we, you know, everybody who's a resident who lives here in Montpelier, um, you know, we want to have, we want to meet that need. Um, and for anyone who wants to move here, we should be having um, housing available. And, you know, we're obviously having housing shortages right now, you know, even for people who can afford it. Even if you could afford it, you couldn't live in Montpelier because there's just not housing that's for sale. So what we're talking about is some kind of a temporary housing <coughs> regarding, <coughs> excuse me, the shelters and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think there's a, a, a goal or a strategy directly reflected in that, so we should, you know, yeah. think about how we would put that in. But, you know, not just, you know, as Kirby was mentioning, not just for homelessness or uh, transitional, but the housing for um, drug addiction. And, um, you know, I'm sure the Justice yeah. Center would comment on, on people who are, you know, um, reintegrating into society from um, through the prison program, and those you know what you know we we should have the housing that kind of addresses all the needs that regionally we should you know we shouldn't be deferring our you know a, a portion of our population to say well they should they should find their housing in Barry. It's like well no, um, there's percentage wise we should be accommodating a fair share of all those housing needs, whether it's transitional housing or group housing or whatever it is. Uh, can I just, uh, right off the bat on this document, so this was submitted by the Housing Task Force, right? Yeah, I do, the, I do the framework and I come up with things and then they sure. work on them. So yeah. just a quick question, because there's also the Montpelier Housing Authority Mm -hmm. Right. So, can you explain to me again what the difference between those two are and what their sort of focus is? 
because I get them confused. I know that they're both All right. So the task force is a, it's actually an ad hoc group. They're not actually technically appointed by city council there. Mm -hmm. And they reflect a number of the key partners, including the Montpelier Housing Authority and Down Street and Interfaith Action and Legal Aid and a couple other ones that are in there. Okay. Um, but the Montpelier Housing Authority is a specific organization that used to be part of the city, probably back a few decades, mm -hmm. and then since is kind of separated out into its own quasi-governmental. We don't fund them. They don't. They're not. They don't work. <coughs> they're not city employees. Yeah. And what's their mission? And they. they um uh, authorize Section Eight housing. Yeah, they so do the Section Eight housing. They're they're okay. they're govern they're quasi governmental agency. I don't know if they're actually their own municipality. Kind of like the schools become their own municipality. I don't know if they technically oh. have that status or okay. if they're just. Yeah. And they're administering federal funds. Yeah, okay. they're they're it's almost one hundred percent federal yeah. funds. Okay. Uh -huh. um, they operate certain housing. I honestly. Unfortunately, cannot off the top of my head name them here. Well, the uh, oh. Pioneer Apartments, yeah. is that what it's called? In the roundabout? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some specific well. housing um, groups. That yeah, there's use. fixed. Yeah, they, they've got some that are fixed housing uh, housing vouchers, and then they do the yeah. housing. Well, they have the housing vouchers, and then they have the fixed units. So the task force is an ad hoc group that has representatives from, like, the Housing Authority and those other legal aid and all that, or they're just an ad hoc group that is understood to represent those interests? I'm just trying to figure out. They are going. the, so the group, if you were to go to a housing task force meeting, you would find um, the executive director of the housing authority. Downstreet has, not the executive director, but one of their employees um, goes to all the meetings. Um, you know, we've got Polly and, I mean, they could, Go through and probably name okay. most of them, but yeah. So everybody usually sends. Um, actually, uh, Jack McCullough, who's now city councilor rep, he's he was actually there as the representative from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, Jen Holler is there, I think, uh, representing Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. But I don't think. I mean, I don't think there. There's no roles that have to be represented. No, it's they just, just people who are okay. into housing. Into housing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, right. that, no, that's yeah. helpful. I'm just. I was just curious what the composition of the group yeah. was and where they sort of. There's yeah. a lot of housing nerds in Montpelier. So <laughs> <laughs> and and they all come to together. Go. Cool. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they all come together. And it, you know, I think it, they started in 1999 <laughs> to go through and say, you know, what can we do to help housing and further okay. housing and. Oh, that's helpful because I was just uh, when I was reading the document, I was like, "Who are these guys exactly?" So. But they do uh, act on the housing, the revolving loan fund. They are administering. They. I think there's a. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I can't help but sorry. Trip in. I there's, think there's a separate committee. Yeah. Yeah, there's oh, a trust I fund see. committee. Trust fund committee. Which okay. which does the, which only meets like once a year. So, so what is the role of the housing task force then with the revolving loan fund? They they don't. So we've got they've got so the trust fund technically now has two funds. We've got the the housing trust fund and we have a revolving loan fund. So we actually have two. Um, oh yeah, it's all spelled out here. So they they will come up with programs. So usually what happens is once a year they will establish a program. They'll go through and say, oh, we should have a program for first-time home buyer. And uh, this is what it's going to be. And Downstreet makes the proposal that goes and says, hey, look, we've got funding for a first-time home buyer program. If the city matches those funds, we could put those together and we could help people buy homes in Montpelier. It's a very expensive place. Um, the city council uh, approves that, um, or the, the trust fund looks at it and says, yes, this furthers our housing goals, makes recommendations to city council, city council approves it. It then goes to Kevin, the community development specialist in my office, to actually administer the program. So once that's done, we do all the processing. You know, you want to buy a house, you come in, you ask Kevin, Kevin, and, uh, well, actually you go to Downstreet, they run it, and then they give all the stuff to Kevin. 
and he looks at all the stuff and says, yep, you check all the boxes and we cut a check and bring it to your closing. So that's, so that's the way that the programs work um, and what the task force would do is to help write guidelines and how we should spend the money and then make sort of recommendations to council. Um, the task force also makes recommendations for how much money we should fund into the into the housing trust fund. So they'll be meeting, I think, on Wednesday to, with city council to go through and make a make a pitch for how much money should go in the budget into the housing trust fund. It's kind of an annual annual thing, and how we should be what what are things we should be recommending. So it they kind of blur a little bit. Um, so we've got most of the stuff goes through the trust fund, but we do have a revolving loan fund that was created last year from leftover money. So we had community development funds for decades, and we would recycled them, and then we finally reached a point where we asked the state if we could just take the funds out of federal oversight and just because it had already met all the obligations, and then move them into individual funds. So now they're looking at how should we spend these revolving loan funds that we have because they have been very difficult for us to use because they were stuck with these old restrictions. So we had a housing preservation grant program that people in town were eligible for, but in order to get access to the funds, you have to prove that you can't afford to pay back the loan, basically. So it ended up with these weird restrictions that you know, if somebody was in a position that needed the help, we really couldn't help them because <laughs> you have to prove that you can't get a loan from a bank. And well, now that we have that restriction out of the way, we can take that money and come up with a, a better way of helping our community. Maybe it's a housing preservation grant, maybe it's something else, but the, the restrictions have gone away except that we need to use it to further housing. So mm -hmm. we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars that we can now use. But that's what they do. I think one thing we came up last time was the percentage for vacancies doesn't necessarily match the number of units. That's the goal. Is that where the 240 versus 150 comes in? Uh, no, well, the two, the 150 was for five years. Um, that was the adopted in the EDSP. Um, but this is an eight-year plan, so mm -hmm. we just multiplied the formula and kept it going out for another three more years, which would be 240 units. Yeah, the two aspects of this benchmark don't seem to quite fit. It's... Yeah, I mean, we can go through and and look at the edits. The If something were to have happened where we added a number of housing units and for some reason a whole bunch of people moved to Florida <laughs> and suddenly va rental vacancies went up to 8%, we probably wouldn't have as much of the second goal because we wouldn't be looking to add more housing and create more vacancies. The reason why we have the bottom is because there's – a very low vacancy rate, less than 1% right now. And the question is, how can we do that? Well, our goal is we're going to increase housing by 150 units and then continue to monitor the situation. And maybe it goes up to 240 by 2028. We're just going to keep adding housing units until we start to see some vacancies. This sort of assumes a static population then. I mean, that's the part I don't understand. If if everything we've talked about in the past is if we increase housing, more people will come here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it won't affect that vacancy rate at all because we have more housing. We'll just have more people. Yes, there will be more people. The, the expectation is um, at a certain point you reach, you, you reach a point where you're adding some units, but there aren't people to fill them. So, you know, we'll add 150 housing units you know, there's two people per housing unit, but we only add 260 people. Well, now we've created some vacancies. 
So we have we have built more than. Or else we've created some units that have a lower than 2.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the idea is people. we're 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 looking at trying to get vacancies because that's what gets your <coughs> the the pressure to increase rent comes when you have less than five percent. That's what the the models will show you. Mm -hmm. So if you've got 1% vacancy, you can expect the rents will increase, which is why rents have increased faster than incomes and everything else, is just because we don't have enough housing. Um, so do, a we, of do we have an actual idea of what the demand is? Like, for instance, if demand is extreme, you, can, you could add 100 units and the vacancy rates would stay the same because the demand's right. from outside the city, right? Yeah. Um, do we have any ideas? I don't know if we have anything concrete that we can um, put our hands on. We know, for example, that to reach 5% vacancy, you'd need probably 60 units vacant in the city at any one time. And you expect that that's, they're not going to be vacant for long. I mean, there's always going to be people coming in, people going out. It's not the same units vacant for, but you'd expect to have about 60 units that would be vacant. So, um, I mean, if I could, what? usually happens for housing projects you get a market study in the market study will look at how many households are in the area do a certain like percentage of who's likely to move how many people rent versus own so it's like an import i mean that's like the tool i think and then there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that you'll hear from realtors or you know, landlords or stuff like that. I think that's how people get it. Demand. Yeah, you, can, Sorry, you have, an, ab yeah, you have you, an absorption but, rate that they would yeah. look at. Well, and that's or, true whether that's you're talking about a commercial, project. you know, when, when Fred Connor or Pat Malone is working on a commercial retail project, they're going to have this thing in the back that they'll go and say, well, our absorption rate for this amount of square feet is going to probably be 24 to 36 months. So we'll build it out. It'll probably be vacant for a little while, but it'll fill up. Same thing with rental units. There's going to be an estimate. I mean, we can pretty much look at the 48 units that were built in the past 12 months that came on the market between Taylor Street and French Block. And I would bet we could call Down Street and they're probably, if they're not booked up, they're probably pretty close to, it doesn't take long to fill those units. Yeah. So. They were already somewhat, some occupied during their open house. <laughs> yeah, during their open yeah. house, they were already <laughs> occupied. So I think our expectation is that it would be pretty high. Um, which is why knowing we need at least 60 to reach 5%, assuming assuming nobody moved to town, we just built 60 units, we'd reach 5%. Um, they're also addressing, which isn't really reflected in here, the issue of Airbnb and some short-term rentals. We have 60 short-term rentals currently, which goes through and says, well, there's our 5% vacancy is just taken up with people who, apartments that could be rented out to people. Is that Airbnb? Sorry, it's like 60 Airbnbs are registered and wow. Yeah. Are they registered or is that just we just used or, someone got online and looked? Yeah, if we went online and looked. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Or, yeah, well, they are, oh, they, I guess they don't have to register with the city, but they do with the state now for ta right, this state, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's they, they do have to pay the additional, ta the taxes. Um, rooms and meals. Rooms and meals taxes. So it's one of those. As a representative of the tax department, I'll tell you that's confidential information. <laughs> oh, how many? How many? How many? How many? How many? Even how many people are paying rooms and meals in the city is confidential. Yeah, you wouldn't. I mean, the city would be able to get information from the tax department on stuff like that. Would not. No. Oh, okay. You're better off just going to the website itself Let's to see. Yeah, that's how we that. always yeah. do it. We always yeah. just go on to the, the top two or three yeah. companies and just go and look at them up and. In some cases, you can determine, oh, this is a snowbird, and this is somebody renting a room within the house, so those really don't count, you know. Yeah. It's kind of being more of a B&B. &B. Um, what we are concerned about, or they are concerned about, are the ones where it's clearly somebody has removed an apartment right. from yeah. Well, the Well, yeah, I'm pool. interested in having Airbnbs be to register in towns, but anyway, maybe we <laughs> so, don't want to go down that yeah, road. Yeah, so they, they're, they are looking at a number of things about that vacancy rate. How can we get that 5% vacancy rate? And as I said, with the idea of 60, just to get the 5%, we know our target number has to be greater than 60. 
significantly greater. Significantly than greater than 60. So they, they, that's why it, it came out as 150 housing units in five years was the goal. That started actually in 2017. Um, so it's we're still looking at trying to absorb or trying to get constructed, you know, about 30 units a year is our goal. Um, and more or less we're do better some years, worse than others, but we want to just keep keep adding more housing units as, as much as we can. So we wouldn't get that vacancy rate until all of the units had been added potentially. Potentially, yeah. yeah. I mean, markets change. I mean, if suddenly there were a great number of jobs created in, in a different community and suddenly a lot of people decided it was, you know, well, if I'm working in Waterbury, I'll move to Waterbury and a bunch of vacancies came up, it's possible we can reach it through other ways. But um, our reality and our hope is that people aren't leaving, um, that this is just, this is reflecting uh, demand. Um, you know, Barry City um, does have vacancies. So it's not a regional issue. You you have available units in Barry City. Uh, we don't here in Montpelier. So um, it's a measure of quality and quantity. Um, well, in terms of the housing units, it just seems low. It seems like a low mm -hmm. number. But oh, it's it, well. It's very difficult having having you know. We looked at this number and we thought that that was a low number when Kevin and I were talking. Um, it's been a challenge. I mean, we have a goal of creating housing, but we're not going to pick up any nail. Uh, we're not going to pound any nails. We're not going to. You know, we don't. We right. have to encourage other people to build housing, and and how can we do that? Um, you know, we have programs that get get us. You know, um, the accessory, the ADU program right. will get us ten to fifteen more. Right. But you, when you start looking about continues. all of these different things, it becomes very difficult to, to to get large numbers unless we do large projects like Taylor Street and. You know, French Block was a large project, and that only added 18 units, um, a very important 18 units. But um, when we start looking at how do we get 30 a year, it's like, well, that's, you know, two French Block projects a year. Um, how can we get the housing market to start picking up and doing, doing theirs? But there hasn't been, there hasn't been the market. Seems like there's potential for some very large projects, though. Like Sabins. Yes, okay. Sabins, Sabins, VCFA, uh, the parcel next to it. Um, there are a number of places that uh, there's Stonewall Meadows, which is out towards uh, up on off of Berlin, Berlin, Street. Berlin Street. Yeah. So what's what's the potential? There? Oh, because they have a lot of property. There was a lot a lot of land that was originally subdivided it had potential for seventy. Um, if we were looking for a place to have single-family homes that would be affordable, that would be a location that could could take them. Um, so we do have a lot of savings pasture. Set. Yeah, limited size. Crest, Crestview, sets, Crestview is another large oh, parcel right. um, that would be probably more high-end housing. But, so we have we we do have potential. The the issue is trying to get. Um, you know, obviously we would love to get. You know. If, if we get a project for Saban's pasture, that could be 200 housing units. Um, yeah. You know, we could we could make our 150 in in short order, but that's we're kind of balancing that with the reality of doing modest infill through these one project at a time, um, adding accessory dwelling units, um, turning duplexes into triplexes and triplexes into quadplexes. Um, we're not looking to encourage people to do what happens in other places in, in San Francisco where you know buy three houses and tear them down to put in a big project. You know, we don't want people coming in and tearing down the fabric of our neighborhoods. Um, you know, we're trying to work with what we have, although we would love to get a big project that could <laughs> do a savings pasture. So are we doing as much as we can to encourage private developers to to develop housing well that's kind of all of aspiration a i mean that kind of gives us what the kickoff for aspiration a which is to have the healthy housing market um the supply of housing in a mixture of types sizes occupancies and levels of affordability 
And so we go through whether I think goal A is the rental housing and goal B is is kind of your single family housing, your for sale single family housing. And then goal C is kind of gets into discussion of the mixes of housing types and occupancy levels. Um, so we do have a number of programs, um, some that we're recommending, some that are existing. Um, so they're looking at adding a utility and infrastructure incentive program. That's kind of a little bit of a TIF. We did an example of this mini TIF for Caledonia Spirits. They needed to do some, they needed some large infrastructure. So the city went through and did the infrastructure on our dime and then through their increased water usage and increased taxes, we take a portion of that to pay back that loan. It's a mini TIF that mm -hmm. doesn't use school, so it doesn't go through the state. It's just our local. But it helps mm. it, it helps to go through and take a project that that's possible but for um, it needs a certain amount of infrastructure improvement. So we've done this once, but we could certainly replicate that same idea for specifically for housing. For housing. So if somebody had a housing idea that said, "Boy, we could do this, but there's only a six-inch water main. We would need eight to do a sprinkler, and we're required to do a sprinkler." Well, maybe maybe we have the opportunity of using, you know, borrowing and doing this mini TIF that goes through and says that that new building is going to generate. X amount taxes, we could take a percentage of those new taxes to pay back the loan. Otherwise, they won't build the building at all. You, know, you can't build a you know a six or an eight unit building if you can't sprinkler the building. So, and if they can't sprinkler the building because there's not a water line in in the road that big enough, then we might go through and say, well, we'll upgrade the water line and you pay us back. Um, and that's kind of a little bit of the theory. So that you actually are calling them mini tiffs. Um, that's how we've kind of described <laughs> yeah. it. Um, but there are various tools that can be used. Um, tax stabilization can be used if it's a commercial housing project. Um, so that was a new addition. So we've got the ADU program. We've got to, again, you, the comment before, continue to participate in the downtown program and growth center programs because those do add benefits to housing if you're in the growth center then you have less exposure to Act 250. Um, and that can save you a lot of money if you don't have to go through Act 250. And then we just have a number of these uh, unified development regulations, which are the zoning. What, what is the Municipal Administrative Procedures Act? So MAPA, we have talked about doing MAPA in the city for a number of years. And um, it would have been extremely helpful in, um, say, the hotel parking garage. If you do MAPA, then you can't be, then you're not a de novo appeal to the state. So you agree to operate through a higher level of process. And if you meet this higher level of process, then the state will only look at you. I don't know what's the opposite of de novo. <laughs> <laughs> On the record. On the record. There we go. So it would be an on-the-record review. So instead, what would happen is they would, the judge would actually take the decision. And we pretty much do enough to already qualify. We just haven't mm -hmm. officially gone through to adopt it. And it's been an interest um, because a number of projects have been sidelined in the city by, um, by neighbors. Um, and so if we had a more of a MAPA administrative process, it could help to streamline the appeal process and keep projects from getting sidelined. So there's a certain mm -hmm. uh, level of development that required for that? You said we qualify. Um, it's, it's a matter, it's a, well, we first have to agree to do it, and then we just need to then find all the, the procedures that we aren't doing and start to do them. Um, so for example, if you're gonna, if we were gonna, we would have to enter things into evidence and we'd have to number them, and then in our decisions, we'd have to number them. We don't currently do that. Do you provide pretty robust? We have extremely robust decisions. Yeah. I mean, mm. I think the hotel decisions were 40 pages long. Right, but the, yeah. but the process attended with that. Is yeah, the process, I mean, there, some of the process things are difficult for other communities. Our requirements for process, you know, yeah, they have to be videotaped. But well, we already do that. 
uh, they have to be, you know, there's certain requirements you have to meet. I think the issues we we don't meet are certain certain admit admission of evidence. Um, the advantage we have, um, Meredith, uh, who is our zoning administrator, is actually uh, uh, an attorney. Um, she has her license in the state, uh, so she's she she could do all the MAPA requirements very easily. I think she just needs to have her checklist of what to do. Um, yeah, it seems like a pretty high value, it, low cost. It's one of those <laughs> ones that, that we've had on that list of boy, yeah. that would be really great if we could do that. Um, it would it would really help to streamline things. Um, so some of the barriers they talk about, you know, uh, continued the requirement of only one parking space per dwelling unit and no required parking in these zoning districts. Parking is identified as a barrier to additional housing, so that's why that's reflected here. Um, so they feel it's necessary to identify as a strategy that we would just not modify that in the zoning? Uh, well, I mean, at this point, they've worded as continue, yeah, right. continue to do it. We want to reflect what, when we write our strategies, we want to reflect what we're doing already as well as okay. what we should be changing. Um, if it was felt that we should expand that, then I think we would just go through and amend that to say continue this policy of having no parking requirements in these districts and explore expanding that to other districts or whatever. If there was a goal, um, from a parking standpoint, these were the ones that they felt. You know, There may be a different opinion from somebody in the Transportation Committee or an energy committee or somebody who may feel that we could move that other places but for them these were the highest density districts <clears throat> um, we allow duplexes triplexes and quadplexes as permitted uses in almost every district in the city so that that's a goal um, the sprinkler ordinance was changed last year, so that's in there. Um, continue to support private housing projects through public-private partnerships. The Sprinkler ordinance was repealed, wasn't it? No. <coughs> it was only, it was amended. Amended to... Because um, it still applies to larger, okay. Got yeah. It. Got Anything it. over four units. Right, right, it wasn't specific to just... Yeah, it used to be everybody had to go yeah. through it. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Had a serious impact on housing, I would think. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So yeah, we'll we will, um, yeah we'll see over time how much how much impact that that makes for new units coming online. Um, it was like one of many barriers, but it was a big one. At least. For, well, for example, if somebody wanted to add an ADU or a duplex, they could potentially have been required to sprinkle previously. So it opens up the possibility of the. A lot of the smaller okay. infills. Yeah, with the program that we are now administering, right? That yep. you're administering the accessory dwelling unit program. So, otherwise, we yeah would have spent more money on each of those units. So, goal B talks about the for sale housing. That's mostly your single family homes. Um, that six months supply of housing is a funky number to wrap your head around, but it really is. How many housing units? would we expect um, you you want to have on the market a six month supply of housing um, because if it's less than that it's the same as your um, vacancy rates if you end up less than that your prices go up so in the past year we've been at about two to three months so a house will come on the market and be sold pretty damn quick and so that's, Affo more, that's more why affordable ones are more like make that days and yeah. two or three before days. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is counting yeah. all the other pieces. That's not just <laughs> yeah. it's pretty quick that things get on and off the market. So that's why we've seen prices of housing again still going up in the city. Um, in the past year, prices have gone up another large percentage. And we're, we're not going to get that to change until we can get um, more supply of housing on the market. Is there ever any discussion about size of housing um, in terms of inc possibility of increasing our supply of smaller um, housing, mm -hmm. not just rentals, but in 
actual residential. Yeah, I mean, we've we've these guys capture the for sale market. Um, we, you know, I mentioned it's single family homes, but it could be condos, it could be, uh-huh. it could be mobile homes, it could be tiny homes, it could be um, any number of anything that's allowed. Anything that you can purchase for sale housing. Um, that's where they look at the six month supply and as a mark as one mark the the related piece to that is usually they want to have building lots usually want to have 24 to 36 months supply of building lots because that will help to supply the construction of housing but we have like no building lots (laughs) there's no yeah there's a zero supply so that's been one of our barriers if you know we kind of have to go all the way back to the kind of the basic of going saying look we don't have building lots we can't even talk about building housing until we can start getting building lots we have Sabin's pasture. We have 100 acre parcel. We don't have 80 acre subdivided lots sitting there waiting to be sold. Um, there's just it's until we can get that subdivided and platted, then we can go through and say, well, the road's not built there yet, but it's platted, and we can talk about how to get the road built. Is that really what the city's looking at? I mean big parcels that need to have front to back subdivision there's no quarter acre lots here and there there are small ones we've we've gone through um you know some of the pieces that 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 people are looking at um the developer so one of the issues they've identified is we don't have a developer class so we don't have we're not like Burlington, where you've got a lot of companies that that's their job, is to find pieces of land, buy them, subdivide them, and build things. Mm-hmm. We don't have that class of contractor in, in central Vermont. Um, so that makes it difficult for us to kind of get those projects. What we do have is a lot of people who do repairs and small projects. So, I mean, the people that come through, there are probably 10 of them that we could go through and and kind of pick them out to go through and say these are the guys who would pick up that quarter acre. Ward Joyce picks up that house on Berlin Street um, down from Dunkin' Donuts, Mm -hmm. tears it down, it's a vacant building, tears it down and builds his duplex on that. Um, We've got a number of people who have that capacity to buy a vacant house. So what we've been trying to do is to connect up the developers with those vacant dilapidated houses and say, what's the barrier why hasn't this moved why haven't people fixed it up it's vacant it's falling down there are trees growing out of the porch there's you know yeah. are the taxes getting paid so we'll find out is it coming up for tax sale and you know i think there are some two properties on charles street that came up and you know there were a dozen builders who wanted to buy that on tax sale so mm-hmm. we we can we just have to get those moving and get them back on the market because we've got people who will buy those and fix those up this the city doesn't have to inspire people to do that people will buy it fix it and make money on it yeah i mean i guess my my question is i mean every you know everything is just like savings past year after that i don't i don't know what's yeah. left i mean we've got a couple other smaller ones that we that we look at there is the the, the parcel that's next to it the the one that they're doing the bathhouse proposal on mm-hmm. that same parcel the same person doing that project is also looking at housing along uh, Berry Street that would be another opportunity we don't have a lot of these larger ones um, Crestview, we, right? I mean, basically. Crestview would be a very big one that's off Terra Street that's another hundreds of acres big uh, that's um, we've got when, uh, just so I understand is that is that on the other side from the capital complex of Bailey like if you're going Bailey uh, so if you want Bailey and Terrace and so the Redstone building is owned by the same person okay and then as you go up Terrace Street towards Middlesex there's a small road on the left that would connect you over to basically as far as, walk, over to his as far as walkability, is that that I've always thought of that as closer to downtown. Therefore, maybe walk, like what we when we talk in here about walkability, that it's walkable, I more walkable than these neighborhoods that are already out there. Yeah, that yeah. was his. That was one of his arguments to to being included in the growth center was that he he's actually more walkable closer to the downtown yeah. because he has the redstone parcel. He now could do a development on top 
with a walking path through the redstone would have been his block before he would have had everything that came down to redstone building but not technically had the legal ability to get across so now he could develop up top with walking paths or bike paths yeah. or shared use path that could come down how big is that parcel a redstone no the his, his parcel of, oh that's got to be i mean alan like all alan woods. owns oh. 600 acres okay I mean, it comes. It goes like all the way down all the way, all yeah, yeah, all the way to State Street. Yeah. He goes all the way around the cemetery, oh. all the way to Middlesex, and it's oh. you know quite. And if there was a sincere interest in developing it, yeah, yeah, you'd think that we could work with that. And I think in certain cases, we we have hoped for years that we don't want to we don't want to do. We want to help. And so we've, yeah. tried, we've been trying to find people who would purchase Saban's pasture and then come to us and say, here's, you know, here's what, what I need from the city in order for me to develop this parcel. We haven't had that. Um, and I think the same thing with Crestview. I think if there was a proposal that said, we'll put in X number of housing units, here's what we need. We need the city to help extend the sewer line or build a road or or something then or, or give us tax stabilization or give us and then then we could go through and consider how we would help but we we've tried to avoid for a long time being the developer yeah. um, and we'll see if that we'll see if that changes because people have talked about savings pasture for a long time as well if the city buys savings pasture then we could get the park that we want and we get the housing that we want and considering nobody stepping up to build it Maybe we buy the parcel and then subdivide the lots, and then we sell the lots to developers. Um, I don't know where that conversation will go, um, but people throw around ideas a lot. That's just one of those ideas that is out there to get through that barrier of we don't have any lots, yeah. so people won't build. But it is in the TIF district, so we've 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 put things in place so we can make a project like these happen so um, so again so to increase housing um, first-time home buyer downtown programs MAPA again um, sprinkler ordinance again um, well that's just in this case it's just mentioning that it's to exempt single-family dwelling units but it's more than that right but is this this particular section only uh it's the for sale so i guess if it were a, a four unit condo then it would be more than a single family right i just that, yeah. that i just that kind of flagged something for me because it is more than that right yeah i can see correct then um so again the we're, we are look, still looking to, to look at sprinkler incentives. Um, we still want people to do it, and so um, that's still being included. Um, and, and developing a housing market and re uh, marketing and outreach program really is to try to put all these tools in place and then try to get that developer class. And we really can't get there until we can start going out and contacting and talking to people to say, you can make money in Montpelier developing housing. Yeah, I mean, I guess my comments on these two questions, or two sections, sorry, goals, they could be, there's some repetitiveness, mm -hmm. they could be combined. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't know, I think to me the most important thing is to lay out a goal for number of units and a marketing and outreach program. Like, I don't know how much we need to talk about the sprinkler ordinance, but maybe that's important to remember that we, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I also would ask them, like, how how would the house, what's the vision for how the housing marketing and outreach program to flesh that out a little bit more and what resources would be needed? Because that does seem like a very important piece, and it's sort of like the last yeah. strategy of that right. goal. I was surprised. Yeah. So far down. Yeah, it was one that was added in later. It was more a matter of timing than it was ranking them by any importance. Um, 
And, and I think we talked about this last time with the historic resources. Um, we had laid them out to be goal and strategy. And we talked about when we, when we get done, we may reshuffle them yeah. to go through and say, well, this is talked about three times. We may just say it once and have yeah. something in the end that'll reflect Yeah, I mean, that. they don't necessarily need to do that. I'm just, just a comment. That's yeah. a little bit clunky to look at it here. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I second your comment about whether or not we need to continually bring up the sprinkler ordinance, but... Unless it's to notify people. Well, it was. I mean, it was something that had been identified by some as a barrier, and I think because it was happened when this was written initially two years ago, it was saying that we should do it, and okay. when we did it, <laughs> we adjusted it to yes. say continue to oh, do it. All right. So um, it was identified say, as a barrier. So doesn't say expand it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say expand it. It doesn't say. Okay. Um, consider amending the sprinkler ordinance to exempt I think is what it originally said um, okay. so um, again some of these things that are just for the maintaining the housing types I mean we talked about continuing there's a little bit that might seem why would why does that matter so much to continue to talk about these but um, we are actually our, our zoning congratulations to all the work you guys did um, on amending the, the districts. I look in my projects, when I look at the, the national stuff, people are trying very hard to get out of the old Euclidean zoning of this is single families, this is multifamily district. So all the multifamilies are together, all the single families are together, all the commercial is in one place, all the industrial is in another place. And for us, it's, we already allow single families, duplexes, quadplexes, multifamily. And, you know, we have these great mixed neighborhoods. Um, and so we just reflect that by saying to con we should continue to do that. Our densities are, um, because of the work that we did in the zoning update to make that 90% rule apply, it, it makes a big difference for not having a lot of nonconformities that other communities when I read as I said when I'm reading my stuff mm -hmm. I'm always like you know these guys are like did you know that you can't build your neighborhoods it's like I can we already <laughs> did, that. We did that we already fixed that yeah. um, and then there has been a request from them to to add in some incentives for the creation of senior housing projects um, do, do they imagine what that might be they didn't get into the details they just felt that was um, flag. It's a flag. It, it comes in in a couple of different directions, one of which is we have a lot of single-family housing that is currently occupied um, and underused um, by uh, predominantly seniors who, are, who had housing that they raised their families in and they're now kind of over-housed. Um, and we have a lot of younger families trying to move to the city. If we could have more senior housing opportunities um, some people may look to downsize oh, move out move rather, out yeah, and yeah, therefore we, we did the duplex ADU uh, changes and that was that, to give them another op uh, option to option. go through and say well if you right, want to stay there yeah. great let's take some of that extra space and turn it into an ADU or somebody may just go and say it's you know I'm going to move and that it reflects a little bit of the downsizer initiative and a little bit of just a reflection of our demographics. People are getting older, and we're going to have a lot of seniors, um, and we should look to get more senior housing projects. Because we're also where a lot of our surrounding communities retire to as well. Barry City, Berlin, Montpelier, we, we have sewer capacity. We could absorb places where, you know, Callis and Woodbury isn't aren't going to have the ability to build the senior housing project. Um, so. so, yeah, our first, the first um, aspiration really looked at the housing market. Um, most people are going to buy and live in housing that's market housing. So we really wanted to make sure we supported that. The second one started to look a little bit um, at neighborhoods, um, you know, basically how housing comes together. 
and we want our neighborhoods to be proximate to open space and recreational resources, walkable and bikeable to the downtown with a mix of uses, complementary neighborhoods down um, beside it. So you might have, uh, you know, just residential for the meadow, but you also have an abutting Elm Street area, which is mixed use. So you would have the ability to, you know, within walking distance to a mixed use area. So I think those were some of the goals that we were looking at is to making sure, and most of these are really just supporting what we have for other plans, supporting the green plant plan, supporting complete streets. Um, you know, the housing people aren't going to put sidewalks in, but they, they support the complete streets plan to put the sidewalks in. Do we have a written housing and neighborhoods plan? The, uh, the this bottom, is... The last one? Yeah, under goal C. Approval of work plan. It says the stra plans. first strategy under goal C is the housing and neighborhoods plan supports the implementation. This is the housing and neighborhoods plan. Oh, this is it. Okay, yeah. all right. All right. <laughs> yes, this plan, yeah, this right. housing and neighborhoods plan supports these other guys. All right. Um, all right. Speaking about itself in the third person. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Right. Maybe I should say this, this housing and neighborhoods plan. plan. This plan yeah. that would help. Yeah. I think uh, that, that could be another place where it says Montpelier or the city, I mean. Yes. I yeah, and I haven't gone through to make that, that change. Um, so the goal C kind of gets, or aspiration C kind of looks at all those rules, all those things that we do that make um, housing and neighborhoods safe and healthy, energy efficient, resilient, designed for all the users. So this is really where we start talking about our building codes, health codes, zoning codes, sprinkler ordinance. Mike, sorry, can I... Can mm -hmm. I just ask about the last strategy on, on aspiration mm -hmm. B? Um, continue to allow housing above commercial uses, um, but there's nothing in there about encouraging it or um, incentivizing it. I mean, we've got a lot of vacant space still. So, um, yeah, when it comes to regulations, um, and this was in that, that implementation strategy, um, the butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns. Right. When we talked about regulations, you could go from discouraging to incentivizing to allowing to, or you know, I guess it would be dis okay. disincentivizing right. and then it, incentivize and then require. Right. So you kind of have right. this, this thing along there. They just tag, because this is talking about regulations, they peg that when they're just gonna say, hey, we should, we should at least just continue to allow it if there's a goal that says we should go more than just allowing it. In some cases, things will happen simply by allowing it. Right. Things won't happen because you don't allow it, so. Well, we, if we're incentivizing the senior housing projects, I guess they are saying um, they have used incentivize in previous strategies. Yes, and yeah, and I think in that case, they were trying to get more, um, work more with the planned unit developments and those types of things to be able to up with strategies to incentivize senior housing. Uh, in this case, they were just acknowledging, again, because I've, I, I see beyond Montpelier, I can see, um, you know, when I reviewed some regulations for another community, they didn't allow two primary uses on the same parcel. So you, it was very difficult to put a daycare facility in a single family home because they were both primary uses and you were only allowed to have one primary use. It seems ridiculous, but you'd be shocked how many zoning regulations in, in the United States have requirements like that. Ours, we already have kind of sifted through that to say you can have mo as many primary uses as you want, um, and you can you can mix them. So you can have residential units over your commercials. Or, so they were just read, willing to allow, but not to um, to incentivize or encourage yeah I mean that was basically a choice yes that they made yep all right because this would also be something that we could modify the zoning regulations to incentivize yeah I mean we'd have to have a conversation of how we would how we would do, do that. that right but um, so yeah, the next set, C just was where we kind of lumped together all of those rules and regulations. How would we, you know, 
when it comes to safety, we, we as a city, we enforce building codes on single family homes. We don't have to. Um, as a city, our building inspector does. Um, we're only required by state law to do commercial. So uh, commercial and industrial. So we enforce it because, and, and this kind of explains why we, why we do that, because it establishes minimum safety and we do it for the safety of the people who live here. Um, same with health codes. Um, improve the long-term efficiency. Um, these will probably get modified a little bit to reflect what comes out of the energy plan. Um, <coughs> um, can I, in, in, with both of these, I think they're both laudable. That's great. But, um, and I just don't know the answer to this, but it'd be helpful, I think, for the city plan, at least for this section, and I understand that's going to tie into the energy plan, is if there's ways to identify how the city can more specifically support the implementation of those plans. I just don't know what the answer to that is. Um, yeah, the details I mean, of how those yeah, energy yeah. plans would be implemented are in the energy plan. Yeah. Okay. And I think that makes what, sense, what it is on this side is just going to say, hey, we support what they're doing. Yep. All right. However they're doing it. However they get it done, we don't Hopefully care. Hopefully we're going to have a plan <laughs> by, prepared yeah. by someone. Okay. So this, um, so again, goal C, same thing. It's just tying into almost acknowledging what we already do um, to everybody. We, we have river hazard regulations, and we have them because it is for the safe and healthy of our residents. Is, is goal D, it says universally accessible. Are they talking about ADA accessible? Yes, predominantly that's ADA accessibility. Then how does the complete streets piece come into that as a strategy? Under Goldie? There must be. Uh, it's both. So it's improved neighborhood accessibility and increased the number of homes that are universally accessible on the first okay, floor. Okay, so, so there that's were two. for the neighborhood accessibility. I yeah. see. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing we, we have here is the, the, the more broad discussion that explains all the other things that we do. Um, housing for all, affirmatively furthering fair housing in order to protect people from discrimination, promote economic opportunities, and create a diverse, inclusive community. So most of what the Housing Task Force does is really, you know, why do we sponsor French Block and all these different projects, um, most of that is actually coming into into this area, um, affordable housing, and what are we doing to further affordable housing and fair housing. So under goal A, strategy, the first strategy, the housing planning effort would be something that would be done by whom? Uh, that would be housing task force so the likely candidate for that project would be the um, the State Street Church um, oh right Christ Church so Christ Church has been looking to do a housing project on the back of their church mm -hmm. and that has been in conversation because they need they need the parking garage and so the parking garage both helped and hurt their project um, but they worked out a deal that um, works for them and helps with their project to get going. So there's um, a number of these that um, will eventually need some funding, and that would probably be 30 to 40 units of 40 affordable housing. Is that one project? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the discussion. Existing so build, existing building too. I mean. The yeah, the building would come down. The existing rectory when? building on the back. That, yeah, that kind of extension off the back. Yeah, could be replaced. it's a really poor. Yeah, it's a really low quality structure, and so um, they they're going to keep that face. That face is State Street. That granite face, but mm -hmm. they would build a new addition on the back. Are you talking about aspiration D goal A? Yeah, that well, the question was um, mm -hmm. supporting at least one planning effort to identify community housing needs and study. Um, well, yeah, I read that differently. Oh, that, that may be the different one. That's the fair housing one. There is one in here where they talk about doing one project. Okay. Or there should be. That's... Um, yep. 
Yeah, to have two hundred thousand dollars in reserves, and that's what the two hundred thousand dollars in reserves is for. Um, is for. We we match funds, yeah. and that's okay. a lot of reasons why we get so many funds um, from the state and federal government um, when we apply to CDBG funds is because we're the city has been willing to raise money and then put them into these projects. So, you know, it'll be a five, ten million dollar project, and we'll put a hundred thousand dollars into it. And even though it sounds like a small amount of money to the people we are applying for funds for, seeing the city's commitment to the project by putting real dollars behind it um, helps us get funded. So, yeah, I mean, this strategy of the housing planning effort to identify community housing needs seems like it also needs some understanding of what resources because you probably the housing task force is not going to do that themselves you'd hire a consultant yeah I think. yeah yeah the number of times we I think in the past what these have been used for in the past is um, usually we do a barriers to affordable housing every couple of years um, there'll be other studies similar to that where we try to understand something about our housing um, needs and so we wanted to reflect that in there because sometimes downstreet or other folks will be the ones that do this and they want the grant support so we can be able to identify that and point to that. So was there a, rec uh, was there a barrier study recently done? So we look at that? Uh, I, think, I think there was. They, they know what it is. It may be a barrier study that comes up. It may be something else. I know 2014 there was one. I don't know if there was another one that came up. Are these general barriers, or are they looking at just one specific? Issue? They'll study broadly. Um, okay. And it, sometimes it may be. Hmm. Yeah. If it's if it's not a lot of trouble, so could you share the last one with us, and I think that would inform our yeah. work on this. So, um, yeah, that's the, um, the most recent. Um, so these guys, the housing committee had had this probably back in 2017. They were the first ones, and actually 16, they may have been the first ones that we started working on this on. We revised it in 17, revised it in 18, and they just finished revising this a couple of weeks ago again. So, um, again, um, Perhaps we need to add elements for homelessness. Um, we can certainly see whether they, they feel they have things that would apply to this or, as we said, community services. They will certainly be included. All the committees will probably be included somewhere, um, whether they get asked to, to craft a, their own chapter or not. Or whether it would fit into this. Or whether it fits yeah. into this one. So we're talking about temporary housing. It, yeah, it could be. I don't know what they're, I don't know where they are thinking. So I have to kind of see. Yeah. You also asked about the, the drug treatment piece. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably one, your your idea would probably be one that would get inserted somewhere in that aspiration yeah. D where we, where, we, where we have that. Um, Do we, we probably look at, you know, is it already allowed under state law or is it something you know are we looking to simply allow it in the regulations or is it something that we are is our strategy our action step to sponsor or you know mm -hmm. i think we have to kind of it's, i think downstreet's done work on this too and then downstreet's involved in some of this Definitely. so yeah. downstreet would be i think be one that could help answer that do we need to incentivize it or just simply allow it you know kind of question and are we not allowing it now Aren't we allowing it in, in housing districts? I think it depends what is the technical, what is it that's being looked at? In some cases, something small like a group home. Yeah. And group homes have a special definition under state law. And which one are we talking about? Because I think one, one of them does not qualify. And I can't remember if it was the drug treatment or if it is the... furloughed prisoners. I can't remember which one. One of them is expressly not 
you know, a group home that is for this is not considered a group home that's a protected use. So. Um, yeah, I feel like Downstreet may have like a whole section on their website. I don't know if you've looked at it, but I could send that around if that's helpful. If people yeah. are interested. Yeah, that can be I helpful. Think they, I think they have some stuff specifically maybe even yeah. on. And even if we've got specific things, I think if we if we came up with a specific list that said we would really like to see some some conversation or some understanding of, of this, this, and this, I think the housing task force would, you know, really take would would really enjoy taking that as okay, you know, maybe we should we should look harder to make sure we you know, because when I put these things together, I'm trying to do the best I can to throw everything at it. And if there's something that's missed, that's you know, that's what this process is for to go through and say, you know, we really Definitely. didn't tackle this. And are we, um, you know, we will have a chapter in, as a part of the governance chapter, um, we've got the goals of being an inclusive community. Um, what is it? An inclusive, equitable, and engaged community. That's the um, mission of the um, of the other committee that was created this year, and so that's going to be one that's going to come up in governance and how we we operate. But it also is going to have to be reflected in our chapters. Um, because we certainly don't meet that if we exclude groups of people. So. Yeah, I think this is great. This is really great work. Do we have any other comments to send back to the housing task force? Okay. Just those few things, so. Do we want to, if you mentioned the Airbnb, do we want to add that to the conversation or not really? We could, at least they've the extent. They've talked about it and they've housing, decided not to pursue that angle. But I haven't heard them talk about what you're talking about. So, I mean, if there's, I, I would definitely think. Group homes. I think with Air, the Airbnb issue is like, to what extent is, does it create a problem for yeah, housing? Yeah, right. I don't, I don't know. And, it does um, and that could be something we could ask about. What what their feeling is for how could, much of a problem could be that a is. continue to monitor. Continue or, to monitor. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, is what do we? What do we do with that information? I mean, once we have a better sense of what it is, what cities do know. cities do things to curtail you know, short-term rentals is yeah. the like isn't, general I mean, term used for that. Isn't part of it too, in terms of limiting people taking entire apartments or yeah. or entire homes and then moving to Florida for the winter? Um, doesn't some kind of owner-occupied building help to there, there are a number of strategies communities have done. Um, larger communities have had bigger issues in that I guess there's there are large there are companies now that just go through and buy you know you'll find entire streets that have been bought up by one company you know if it's down in Florida and mm -hmm. the coast or something. Montreal. 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 Yeah. Yeah. If you want to visit Montreal you'll find an Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. So that whole city's Airbnbs now. Yeah. But that's that's been the issue. We we haven't seen that here as much. Um, a lot of ours are kind of small, one off. Yeah, that's kind of what I was. Two off things. So that's kind of getting at. We're not we're not Brooklyn. Right. <laughs> like yeah. I, and I understand. And, and, and also, there's I mean, this has come up a few times in our conversation. But you know, there's some people I, I know of some people in town that that use you know one of these websites, but it's for their whole house that they kind of share with the guests. Which is not a housing create problem really, as opposed to like these other situations right. that we're talked about, where a, a a a condo is bought, taken off the market, and used just for Airbnb, and yeah. that's the thing. That's that's yeah. potentially and, a problem. But, but we don't really have an idea know. of how many of those are actually happening in the city. I mean, it just seems to me that the underlying the risk of the Airbnb issue is it impacts the vacancy and. You know, and to the extent that we have a very low vacancy rate as it is, you know, I, I think I it's, just I it's just hurting think, our efforts to. Well, I mean, otherwise. I get that, but I mean, we're talking about, you know, aspirationally having 150 units online in the next five years, 
upwards of over 200 and eight, over in the course of eight years you know I feel like any Airbnb impact would be on the margins at best and I, I just think that that might it, it, it might create a bigger problem not only today it might suck a lot of resources today just sort of getting our arms around it and it would cause bigger problems down the road I just don't think it's worth diving into that issue it's an interesting one, and it's probably important, but I think for purposes of getting this out the door, <laughs> um, I just think it could take up a lot of oxygen. And, uh, yeah. See, like my my interest is more in, I mean, like, to me, Airbnbs are a sort of way that you get around zoning. <laughs> like, you're, you're doing lodging in residential neighborhoods, yeah. and I, I, that's why I think they should have some sort of, you know... I don't know, registration it, it, process or something yeah. in the city. Like I, said, I tend to agree with you, but I, again, I, this isn't Montreal. It's not Brooklyn. Right. No, I, I know it's not. It's not a severe issue. Right. But. And we have a long history of housing legislators in people's homes. So we already sort of have that kind of <laughs> aspect. So if we start cutting the legislators out, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, that, I mean, that to me is a little bit different but yeah, yeah it's, actually it's like a seasonal long-term uh, rental but anyway yeah, yeah. that yeah. one's that one's even mm -hmm. more closely aligned to housing legislators should build their own apartments <laughs> yeah i think they should, they should have apartment buildings in the capital complex <laughs> that we 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 <laughs> up, up on the hill behind that big house <laughs> yeah i mean I've, you know it's anecdotally you know i've heard people in central Vermont generally talk about wanting to you know, do an Airbnb for their home during the ski season, but I don't know to what extent that occurs here in Montpelier. I just don't know. There's 50 or 60 probably. It's yeah. more, it's, 50 or 60? It's well, not during the ski season as much here as it is somewhere. Vermont College. You know, VCFA has a one week intensive. People come mm -hmm. here. Yeah, yeah that kind of thing. I think I agree. I don't know that it's a big problem, but I, I mean, I don't know that it's a big problem, but I think not recognizing it, maybe, could that make us look like we're just like, eh. you know, there's, I don't know if there's a way to just like acknowledge that it exists. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, so when, when we look back at our implementation that the big uh, <coughs> butterflies, rainbows, unicorns, the, the plan, we have planning as one of our things that we can do and that really is for those things that we just don't know either don't know what to do or or just needs and that's why I think in this case we just may monitor and yeah and plan for it yeah. in, in, in accordingly and and just I thought at some point something has got to give so many people are going in, into Airbnb that at some point you know just economics has got to take over I mean yeah. there's got to be a certain thing where you just realize I can make more money renting this than I can an Airbnb and put it back into the rental market but we haven't reached that point and I just don't know when we will but well, I just keep thinking or if we got the hotel built then we would have right. another right. Yeah, or if we have more 80 Airbnbs. units of hotels maybe that takes the air out of some of the if we have Airbnb. more Airbnb units, then their occupancy rate, you know, will go down. And so people would then maybe decide that they wanted to create. But but so many of these are just not appropriate as apartments. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, no, and that's the case. And that was when I was in um, New Hampshire last month. We, that was one of the classes um, at the planning conference I was at was all about Airbnbs and and. Because it was all of northern New England, you've got places that are, you know, Orchard Beach, out to, you know, to Stow and to us, and you know, you can kind of see. Look at these guys, and you're like, I feel bad for you guys. That's just, that's <laughs> rough down there to, to to see how much Airbnb is impacting things. Um, so I feel fortunate that we don't have to try to tackle it yet. Um, yeah. But yeah. certainly these these places that have you know, these beach homes and how much difference does it make down there, you know, if it's a beach home that people are only staying in a couple months anyways, what's the harm in renting it out for Airbnb for the other times you're not there, all right? So maybe we could maybe we could ask the housing task force for just a comment yeah. on what how they perceive it, whether it's a problem. Yeah. yeah. 
that might help just yeah, but, but it doesn't sound like any of us are chapping at the bit to, it just seems like yeah yeah, I mean, I kind of like, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I like your idea of putting something in there that's, like, monitor the... Yeah, like, we're mm-hmm. aware. Right, yeah. I don't want us to feel, I don't want us to people this, at this section and think, like, this is not aware mm-hmm. of the modern mm-hmm. landscape. I have so, one other question. Sure. And we don't have to address it tonight, and I don't really know how to address it, but there's not a ton of inf- anything in here about rental, except kind of generally, and then there's the one... Conduct a housing survey to determine if rental units in Montpelier generally meet minimum housing standards. Perhaps that's enough, but I, and I, I don't have a good answer. I'm just curious. What Where is people that again? Which aspiration? Oh, sorry. It was um. Aspiration C, goal A, and the last strategy. It's all on page four. Right in the middle of the page. And um, perhaps this is enough. To speak to rental units, but um, I just felt like I should ask the question: like, Do we feel like it's enough? I I kind of don't really know. This is out of my for uh, regarding what regarding what issue? Just the quality? Just like or? yeah, quality. If there's enough, then the cost and um, yeah, the have. yeah the enough would probably be in a, in a different. That would probably be more in the first one. Yeah. Aspiration A. Yeah. This one was looking more specifically at, and, it, and it's a question that comes up and goes away and comes up and goes away, and we never know. Um, uh, s- s- some people have felt um, that our house, that some of our housing doesn't meet minimum housing standards, and when we kind of talk more about it, it comes a little bit more down to, you know, I can't believe I pay 1100 bucks a month. When it's <laughs> for this, <laughs> and we're like, that's not really a minimum housing yeah. standard. It actually okay. meets the minimum housing standards. It's just your 1970 shag carpeting. You're paying a lot for this is a, a little. They just haven't updated. Yeah, it's you're paying a lot of money for something that's probably not worth it, but that doesn't make it unsafe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we try to get back to aspiration A, where we're like, boy, if we had more, then there's competition among landlords to go through and say well I can't rent this unit I guess I'm gonna have to fix it up and when I fix it up do we have confidence though that the housing um, units do meet housing standards and that's the question there are some people that come forward and say that they you know regardless people are paying nine hundred dollars for units that don't meet minimum housing codes and that's a question of you know is it is it an issue how big of an issue is it and we just don't have enough to wrap our arms around so it's been proposed it's in this year's work plan to do that survey how um, would that be conducted our proposal at this point um, is to just randomly select a fixed number of units select them out and just randomly go in and ask landlords you need permission of the landlord, you need permission of the tenant to go through and do a housing inspection, and we would just survey and, and examine. I and mean, we can't look at all 1,800 housing units. Yeah, that's what um, I was wondering. We would just pick 30 of them to go in and go and say, you know, if we if we survey 30 and we find 11 of them don't meet minimum housing standards, then we have a big problem. Mm-hmm. If we survey 30 and we don't find many, or if they consistently have the same issue, um, disconnected smoke alarms you know it's like well it doesn't mean minimum housing standards because the smoke alarms disconnected well it probably not you know the solution to that is probably doesn't need a Barry city style rental inspection program where they have a program that their fire the fire department goes in and inspects all the housing units over a period of time Every housing unit, every rental housing unit has to pay $100 a year, whatever it is, $50 a year to go into a fund that pays for the program to get administered. And mm. So, um, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. And if you're, if you are, you know, as I've, I've been this former planner for Barry City, it is a community that had a lot of substandard housing. I mean, it was some pretty bad housing. Um, I haven't seen that here, but I don't get into the houses as often as I did over there. Do, do minimum housing standards include codes, fire code? Uh, usually the minimum housing c- standards are different. They're looking at something different. 
Um, but usually if you end up with a rental inspection program, you will end up usually sending somebody in who's trained to do inspections on both. Yeah, that's right. Because if, if, you know, we're only specifically saying minimum housing standards here, but what if the, you know, the other point would be minimum fire codes? Yeah, we, we would expect most of these probably depending on how you're how you're looking at it you you have housing codes you have fire codes and then you're gonna have ones that are what's you know they don't 100 percent meet it but they're grandfathered in and you know so it depends where you're drawing the line on those but that's that is usually addressed on on you know the amount of work um, of, that would usually require hiring two and a half more right people right that's <laughs> Chris and three other people. Yeah, Chris, yeah. And that would be a lot of work. And so the question is, if, if you have a serious issue, it's worth the money and it's worth the time. If you don't have a serious issue, maybe we find a different way of resolving those. So, well, Okay, so we're, we're out of time. Do we have a third chapter lined up for next week? I don't. Oh, we do have to we, ask the question. Yeah, Two we weeks from now is the 23rd, Christmas week. I can do it. Okay. I'm just. Let's. I said it's in feelers and. Yeah, so it's Christmas Eve. I would say no. Let's skip that. <laughs> is, 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 is that okay with you, Marcel? If we just skip. The twenty third. I'm yeah. gonna be out of town anyway. I, I think so. that yeah, chances are we're not gonna, gonna get pretty thin. All enough. right, so I will cancel the twenty third. So, so, but so for the meeting after that, can we? Yeah, we'll have a we'll have a let's, let's start looking at a third chapter and then review the feedback so far. Yes, and so I've got a number of chapters I'm working on. By that time, I might have energy. I might <laughs> yeah, have, energy. yeah, um, I might have uh, a couple other chapters that I've been working on. So, so the next is the 13th, yeah. Sixth? Second. January. Fourth. Second and fourth. Oh, Second and fourth. Second and fourth. <laughs> 13th? Yeah. 13th. 13th. Right, yeah, that's. Okay. My automatic My, my birthday. I can't believe it's going to be a new year when we meet I next. Know. Yeah, next That's time like, we meet. It's your birthday? It'll be my birthday on oh. the 13th. Oh. 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 Thanks for telling us. Oh. I have to do something special. Right. Um, nothing big on this one. This is just. So you guys are going to meet with Historic tomorrow. Are they going to, are they going to, what's the plan with those questions? Do we have a plan? They're going to start to. We're, we're going to start to see where they go. And maybe start, and then we'll okay. revisit and incorporate right. and make changes that we want to make Perfect. based on what how they answer. Yeah, I kind of held off on doing a real deep dive on the historic preservation one just because I knew we had these questions sort of pending. But yeah, um, okay, we'll, right. we'll get that back. Yeah, okay. yeah, and the more I hear how you guys are are, are asking questions, the more I can mm -hmm. adjust the next ones going forward. Um, we're kind of winging it. We're not following any any rule book. We're making up the rules as we go along. Fair enough. Yeah, I think that it's such a big project. It's kind of got to be flexible. All Can right. We do adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. Oh. Okay, motion <laughs> from Aaron, seconded by Barb, and uh, I, that means we are. It's not debatable. We are adjourned. <laughs>